All right, let's go ahead and get started. Um, thank you all for joining us for our showcase this year and welcome to our second session of our new um, new research projects for the coming year. My name is Corey Mackey and I am the Associate Director here at MACERC. Um, and each year MACERC issues a request for proposals looking for research projects that will advance both the prevention, control, and management of AIS in Minnesota. I'm joined today by four researchers whose projects were selected as a part of this year's request for proposals to give you a sneak peek of what we have planned for 2021. So a few quick introductions for you. Oops. Slides here. Um, Dr. Amy Schrank is the Fisheries and Aquaculture Extension Educator with Minnesota Sea Grant. She is a fish biologist with more than 15 years of experience teaching and conducting research in Great Lakes aquatic ecosystems. In her role at Minnesota Sea Grant, Amy collaborates with fisheries and aquaculture researchers and stakeholders around the state to provide research support and communicate technical information to stakeholders, managers, and the public. Dr. Dan Larkin is an Associate Professor and Extension Specialist in the Department of Fisheries, Wildlife, and Conservation Biology at the University of Minnesota. He and his team conduct applied research in invasive species management and ecological restoration in lakes, wetlands, woodlands, and prairies. Through his extension program, he trains professionals and the public to support early detection and management of invasive species and ecological restoration. Dr. Alan Mensinger is a professor in the Swenson College of Science and Engineering at U the University of Minnesota Duluth. His research is focused on neural mechanisms of behavior, specifically how fish detect, integrate, and respond to external cues in the environment. He and his team have developed an implantable electrode and telemetry system to record physiological signals from free swimming fish. He also has been investigating the potential of acoustic deterrence to be used against invasive big headed carp. And finally, Dr. John Feeberg is an associate professor in the Department of Fisheries, Wildlife, and Conservation Biology at the University of Minnesota. He specializes in quantitative ecology and is interested in helping people make robust statistical inferences when confronted with a variety of messy data situations. So for the session today, each one of these researchers will give a brief presentation on the studies that they will be conducting with MACERC, and then we will open up for questions at the end of the hour. Um, just a reminder that you can submit your questions at any time using the Q&A feature in Zoom. Um, I'll be collecting questions as the, as the researchers are speaking, so there's no need to save all of your questions until the end. With that, I will turn it over to Amy to get us started. Thank you. Okay. Thanks, Corey. Um, today I'm going to talk to you about a project called Enhancing Habitat and Diversity in Cattail-Dominated Shorelines. And working with me on this project is Dan Larkin, who's at uh, Fish, Wildlife, and Conservation Biology at the U, who will talk next. Um, and I want to start with some quick background on nearshore lake communities. So I'm giving you a duck's eye view here of the water surface of what a sort of healthy nearshore lake community looks like. What you notice is a lot of spaces among the plant species. You can see bulrush sticking up. You can see uh, lily pads, um, arrow, arrowhead. Um, so lots of different plants and lots of spaces. If we move down for a fisheye view here, you can see that um, the narrow stems of bulrush protect fish from, from other fish predators, but provide a lot of space for them to swim around. Um, when you have submerged plants with floating leaves and lily pads, that really protects fish from avian predators. So what I want you to see here is that it's really variation in plant physical form that's important for fish when we're talking about near shore lake communities. You probably also know that nearshore lake communities are really important for fish spawning. They're also important for larval rearing and juvenile fish as they grow up. Um, some small bodied species, things like minnows, spend their whole lives in these vegetated nearshore zones. And these are really important food source for the game species that humans tend to care about a little bit more. Um, you have probably noticed in Minnesota lakes, rather than the native vegetation, we are seeing an increasing amount of um, invasive cattail. And this is happening, happening throughout the Midwest. Um, this invasive cattail is actually a hybrid between a native uh, species of cattail and a non-native species ca of cattail, but it's this invasive um, hybrid that's the problem, Typha x glauca. So this species grows faster, it grows taller, and it tends to grow in these really, really dense um, monocultures of plants, as you see in this picture, which is not Minnesota, but Michigan, but same idea. 
um, what happens is cattail really homogenizes the landscape. So instead of that nice um, diverse plant community that you saw in those earlier pictures with lots of spaces and patches, you see um, a, a sort of taifa monoculture. There's been quite a bit of research into how um, cattail, and I'll say cattail and typha, and what I mean is the hybrid typha, just so you know throughout the rest of my talk. Um, there's been a lot of work on how it affects other plant species, soil, um, and, and nutrients, but not a lot of work on how it affects fish. Um, we've done some of this work in, in Great Lakes coastal wetlands, and I want to just give you a, a little bit of background to show you what we found so far. Um, when we're thinking about fish habitat, dissolved oxygen is really important. And so we've looked at dissolved oxygen, you can see that on the y-axis here, in cattail and non-cattail communities, so native um, near shore communities. And what we see is dissolved oxygen is much lower when cattail invades compared to native near shore communities. And then for the fish data that we have, um, you can see this graph is showing you fish abundance on the y-axis. And in the blue, you can see an abundance value for fish in native near shore zone habitat, so with native plants, is much higher than um, fish abundance in um, uh, communities dominated by typha. So there's clearly an effect here of typha on plants as well as fish, um, but this is less, this is less um, known in Minnesota especially. So we know that cattail homogenizes habitat, looks like it's bad for fish, but it's really ubiquitous and hard to get a handle on. So, so what are we going to do about that? And that's a little bit about what our project um, is looking at. What we currently do, this is a recent article, um, September 2020, we often spray herbicide on hybrid cattail. This is particularly bad for things like larval fish and amphibians when that gets into the water. Um, folks also burn cattail. Again, this has, tends to have a lot of non-target effects. Um, there are also mechanical methods. We can harvest cattail um, and we can harvest cattail below the water. Um, so some research has shown that these harvest mechanical methods for harvesting cattail, particularly below the water in smaller localized areas can have some ecosystem effects. So you can see this is a picture of harvesting, a, harvesting cattail through um, a marsh in the Great Lakes and we're cutting it below the water here. And when you come back to these sites a couple of years later, what you see is that native plants have regrown. So we're seeing some native species here. Um, and this is about two years after cutting. So even cutting a, a small bit of typha away uh, seems to help. And when you zoom out across the landscape, what you see is we do this a lot. Um, in Minnesota, um, if you live on a lake, you're allowed to get a, a, a permit to allow you to cut a 15 foot swath of cattail or whatever vegetation is in front of your uh, property to get your boat in or to get to access to open water. So if you took a giant aerial photo and could see all the lakes, you'd see lots of these sort of channels um, where people need to get access to the lake. And we started wondering how does, how does this small scale fragmentation of cattail stands affect near shore lake ecosystems? We saw in the Great Lakes, when you cut cattail, plants grow back. Is that what we're seeing everywhere? So that's sort of the broad idea that we're, broad question that we're asking. Um, this is another specific example from um, a Minnesota lake. And you can see here this encroaching uh, hybrid cattail. And this, this person has cut a little channel for their boat to go in and out. And even in this small channel, we're seeing uh, lily pads growing up. So, so it looks like native species are coming back as long as the seed bank is there. So this is the general idea. Um, our specific questions, does cattail removal increase plant diversity and benefit fish communities in near shore lake ecosystems overall? We're already removing this cattail. Is this good for fish? Is this good for plants? Um, we, we're, our aim is to figure that out. And we also want to know how this varies across regions. We suspect this will be really different in Northern Lakes compared to Southern Minnesota Lakes. So we're gonna look at this regionally in Minnesota. So into the nuts and bolts here of how we're actually gonna do this, um, we'll be selecting about 24 lakes across the ecoregions of Minnesota. And you can see the picture of ecoregions here. At each lake, um, and again, we're gonna select lakes with dense cattail. We'll select two sites, um, a site at which we retain dense cattail and a site at which we'll remove cattail. Um, these sites will be 10 meters long. We chose that width because that roughly doubles the permitted width um, that folks can get now. And I'm gonna back out here and give you sort of our overall timeline. Our plan is to measure ecosystem variables and I'll talk about those in a second before we remove cattail. So we'll measure that at both of these sites. In the fall, we'll then remove cattail at one site um, and we'll use something along the lines of this crazy machine that cuts cattail as close to the sediment surface as we can below the water. Um, and then we'll come back in the subsequent summer and measure those ecosystem variables again to compare what happens. 
Um, so what are we going to measure um, in terms of ecosystem variables, um, things like uh, temperature, environmental variables, temperature, dissolved oxygen, depth. We'll get an index of human development as well. Um, we'll measure plant community at each site. Um, just to give you an idea of how we'll do that, this giant green rectangle represents one um, of these uh, sites and we'll do this at both. We'll probably just look at a transect or two transects at each of our sites and at those little squares we'd measure plant community and percent cover to get an idea of how the plant community changes at, at both of these sites before and after our treatment. And we'll also measure um, fish community at both of these sites before and after our treatment. And we'll do that using minnow traps. These are going to be pretty shallow water zones probably less than a meter. And minnow traps are a really good way to look at fish communities that actually live in these zones. So we'll do a couple of transects of um, minnow traps um, and we'll set these out for 10 days um, each summer at each site. We have um, great collaborators at the Minnesota DNR, Shane McBride and Donna Dustin, who are helping us with site selection. And we're collaborating with Voyagers National Park as well. Steve Wendells and Reed Plum are gonna help us with some cattail removal and site data um, in the north. So just to briefly give you an idea of what we think is, may come out of our study, um, we will have a clearer understanding of how cattail removal affects com fish communities regionally. We really don't have a good sense of this. We have some preliminary data from the Great Lakes, but this will give us an idea of what happens when you remove cattail and its effects on fish. Yeah. Um, we will determine if cattail removal is an effective management strategy. Does this work? Is this helpful? Um, at a, if, if we have lots of small scale removals, can this help at a larger scale? Um, we'll directly inform Minnesota DNR and help them make landowner permitting decisions. They can either keep, keep what they have or they can make different decisions for permits based on what we find. Um, and we also think the public outreach is particularly important, um, especially emphasizing the importance of native plant communities to fishes. We don't wanna emphasize just, hey, let's remove all the cattail. We wanna say, hey, we're, you know, we need these native plants to grow back. That's what's important to fish. So that's what our outreach will focus on. And in terms of what's gonna come beyond the two years of this research, we, we think it's gonna be particularly important to monitor cattail regrowth. So you've seen this picture before um, where the plants are growing up in the middle. Cattail encroach on these um, channels from the side as they grow in through their rhizomes. So understanding how long this persists and what maintenance might be required is gonna be useful. Can you just go along the edges with an aquatic weed whacker and maintain these openings or is it gonna be more difficult than that? Um, Additionally, perhaps other removal configurations will be better. So that's another um, thing that's possible to test. Um, and lastly, and interestingly, the use of muskrats to maintain openings. Um, we've, we and other researchers in Voyagers and in the Great Lakes have noticed that once you open up these dense cattail um, uh, near shore zones, muskrats often come in and they, they like it. They don't care if it's hybrid or native, um, they use it and they also tend to maintain these openings. So kind of an interesting future direction of this research. So with that, um, I know I don't get questions now, but I look forward to your questions at the end and I will turn it over to Dan. Okay, sorry about that. I was having a little trouble finding my mute. Thanks, Amy. There we go. So the project I'm gonna be talking about is evaluating native Phragmites as a wastewater treatment alternative to invasive Phragmites. And I will be doing this work with Walid Sadak, who's a faculty member in agronomy and plant genetics, and Julia Bonin, who's a researcher in fisheries, wildlife, and conservation biology. So invasive Phragmites is a growing problem in Minnesota. We have a native subspecies that is widespread throughout the state, but then we have an increase across the landscape of a European lineage of Phragmites that grows really densely, can spread quickly, and has been demonstrated to displace native plant species, reduce habitat quality for fish and wildlife, and have other ecosystem impacts. 
There are a lot of ways that Phragmites spreads across the landscape, but one of them is that invasive Phragmites is used in wastewater treatment facilities um, in what are called reed beds in order to dewater biosolids. So basically you have the sewage treatment process and you end up with all this treated sludge that is expensive to transport and dispose of. So operators want to concentrate that sludge down by removing water. And this is a very tall, quick growing wetland grass. And you can think of each stem as like a straw that is pulling water out of the sludge uh, through a process called evapotranspiration. And so they're using it as a, a quote unquote green technology to get this water removal function in a otherwise environmentally friendly if it weren't for the invasion aspect and cost-effective way. When this technology was first adopted, there was this idea that Phragmites did not spread by seed. You just had to worry about clonal spread. So it was thought that the invasive Phragmites would stay contained in these reed beds. But we now know that's not true and that it spreads readily by viable seed. In a previous maestrick funded project, we did statewide surveillance for invasive Phragmites. And what's shown here are the populations we found in the, as the purple circles. And there's kind of a correspondence with where we have wastewater treatment facilities that are using these reed beds. So for example, if we zoom in a little bit closer, we often found this pattern as we searched around these wastewater treatment facilities where in close proximity, we would have these clusters of um, wild, invasive Phragmites and work um, not done by us, but in Northern Wisconsin has done genetic tracing to show that this is indeed happening. So this is a problem as we look towards reducing the amount of invasive Phragmites across the landscape, which we think we are at a stage where we have an opportunity to do that through kind of a proactive approach to um, control across the landscape. But one limitation would be having these sources of further spread in these wastewater treatment facilities. So this is, this is a big issue. Wastewater treatment facilities recognize this problem and it's a priority for the Minnesota Pollution Control Agency, uh, which regulates these facilities and the Department of Ag and the Minnesota DNR to figure out an alternative. We can't just tell these facilities to stop using invasive Phragmites because they need an alternative. The communities they're in are dependent on these technologies. So our question is, could wastewater treatment facilities replace the invasive Phragmites with the native subspecies and get the same kind of engineering benefits without the invasion risk? So here we have the bigger, burlier European Phragmites on the left and the somewhat slighter, less dense, um, native subspecies on the right. So in trying to make this transition, there are a lot of considerations that need to be worked through and we need to do some basic research and work with wastewater treatment facilities to determine if this is feasible and help them through this transition. Um, the invasive Phragmites, it's larger and it's faster growing, so it's likely to have greater water removal potential than native Phragmites. We're starting out with that expectation. But we wonder if the native Phragmites can perform well enough to get the job done. And how can we optimize performance of native? There are facilities in the upper Midwest that have transitioned to native Phragmites, but it's been with variable results. And we think we could do some fine tuning to make that transition more successful and get better water removal. So essentially we are on a search for super natives. We wanna find the biggest, baddest native Phragmites that's out there and test it experimentally to see if it will perform this function. Throughout our field work and surveillance efforts, we come across these populations like the one shown here on the left that, um, you know, you drive by it and you think surely that's invasive Phragmites or so much of it, it's so tall and dense. 
But on closer uh, examination, as these uh, folks from the Minnesota DNR are doing, turns out this is actually native Phragmites. And so there's a lot of variability, and we want to find the sort of highest performing super native Phragmites. And then we're going to go through this multi phase screening process. So we're going to start out with field work. Um, revisiting these populations of native Phragmites that we um, have in our data set from our earlier work and taking some basic measurements. And then we're going to select a set of populations for further study, starting off with what are called common garden experiments. You have to have the different genotypes growing under the same set of environmental conditions so you can attribute performance differences to their um, genetics and physiology rather than just where they happen to be growing around the state. And then after screening a larger set of candidate um, strains of native Phragmites through this process, we're going to subject the winners, the most promising genotypes, to whole plant water removal experiments. So we'll do something like this, which Waleed does um, in his lab with agricultural species like the soybean shown here where we um, use what are called lysimetry experiments to actually measure whole plant water removal um, to identify performance of this function. And then we'll be taking the informa information back to uh, the partners we're working with, both the state agencies and the wastewater treatment facilities themselves to look towards the next steps for how we can support this potential transition. So hopefully I'll have time to answer questions later. And I think I'm now turning it over to Alan if he wants to start his screen sharing. Uh, thank you, Dan. Uh, so we have a, a fairly exciting project, we hope. Uh, we're trying to increase the effectiveness of uh, our previously designed uh, acoustic deterrents against big-headed carp by adding carbon dioxide to the mix. And uh, I will be running the project along with uh, Peter Sorensen from the University of Minnesota Twin Cities, Corey Susky, who's an expert in fish carbon dioxides from the University of Illinois, and Clark Dennis, who just received his PhD from the University of Minnesota, and he will be the postdoc on the project, operating out of Illinois, but doing most of the work at MESARC. So, as I said, we've, we've had some success looking at acoustic deterrence against big-headed carp, and there's two types of acoustic deterrence we've been using. The first one is just basically broadband sound, and in this animation, we'll see the silver carp move towards the source to the sound and get repelled by it. They find this sound uh, very irritating and will uh, constantly move away from the source of the sound up to a point. The other one is a bioacoustic uh, fence that Peter Sorensen has developed and that combines uh, both bubbles, uh, sound, and light. And in this case, the fish goes towards the, uh, the uh, fence or the bubble barrier hits it and then is, is turned around. And again, uh, this works uh, reasonably well. However, um, fish like to continually challenge both deterrents. And while the sound is irritating or the bubbles and the sound they find irritating, there's really no penalty uh, to the fish, if you can imagine. You can imagine a very, very uh, motivated fish that wants to get upstream to spawn after about 10 or 15 times of challenging these barriers, they may just decide to blast their way through them. And so what we felt is that if we can add the penalty to the barrier, uh, you know, some people use electricity. Uh, in this case, we're gonna use carbon dioxide. Fish hate carbon dioxide. Uh, they have internal and external sensors to detect the carbon dioxide, and they will avoid it strongly and consistently. And if you can just imagine, not only is carbon dioxide in itself bad, the fact that if the water is high in carbon dioxide, it's more than likely low in oxygen. 
and fish really are attracted to high oxygen levels in water. And so if we can just get this, if we can combine the carbon dioxide with the sound, we think that this will greatly diminish the uh, motivation of the fish to challenge these barriers. And so there's, there's two sub-projects. One um, is using the bioacoustic fence. Now this has just been deployed in Kentucky Dam or Barkley Dam in Kentucky. And this is the one that uses the uh, bubbles, sound, and lights. And so if you look on the right of the screen, you can see the, the bubbles coming up here. And you can see as the fish approaches it, it's supposed to be deflected away and, and not go upstream and uh, continue its migration. Now the Sorensen uh, lab is trying to enhance the bath. So as I said, it's a bubble curtain, but right now the bubbles are made out of compressed air. So the thought is replacing the bubbles with carbon dioxide and to see if it can increase the effective deterrence of the fence and also stop the fish from challenging it as often as they might do. So at Mesark, uh, Peter's designed this, this very nice flume. He can recreate the bubble barrier. He has fish that will swim around this flume and challenge the uh, bubble barrier. And so he will look at the differences between challenging the bubble barrier when it has just compressed air and when it has CO2. And some of the questions is, is can we get the CO2 into the bioacoustic fence? What's the optimal concentration? And is it more effective than just compressed air? And of course, what is the effect on native species? The second part of the project is actually to combine carbon dioxide with sound. If you remember Pavlov's classic experiments of conditioning, he would condition dogs to associate the sound of a bell with food. And eventually he would just ring the bell without the food and the dogs would start salivating. What we want to do is we want to condition the fish to associate sound with the imminent release of carbon dioxide, the penalty. And so not only would they find the sound irritating and leave, they know that if they don't leave quickly, that they're gonna get blasted with a CO2, which they really, really find adversive. And so if you can just imagine how this would work, and I apologize for the crude animation, but this is a lock chamber. And both of these uh, device, both of these deterrents are designed to work at lock chambers. The upper Mississippi is full of locks and dams. And most of the dams are very, very stout physical deterrence to the upstream migration of carp. However, the adjacent navigational locks provide a conduit for the invasive carp to swim upstream. So we're targeting these locks for both the bath and the carbon dioxide plus sound deterrent. And so here's the, the, the way we had originally designed it is we would just have the sound in the chamber, the, the uh, uh, lock would open and the fish would swim away. Well, now we're going to add not only the sound, but we're going to start uh, putting CO2 into the, into the chamber and outside the gates. And hopefully this combination will condition the fish to associate sound with the CO2. And in future uh, times that we hope that this will make the sound only much more effective than just um, um, when it, the fish had not been conditioned to associate sound with such a negative stimulus. And so the goal of the carbon dioxide and sound portion of the project is to condition fish to associate higher frequency sound with carbon dioxide. Now this is important because the fish really find this higher frequency sound much more irritable than lower frequency sound. And the nice thing, most, not all, but most native fishes cannot hear this sound. So the impact on native fishes is diminished by you is using this higher frequency sound. And we believe it's going to increase the effectiveness, effectiveness of sound only deterrence, which is important because carbon dioxide is, is expensive to use. And also it does impact native fishes where the sound only impacts a few species of native fishes. So if we can 
condition the fish to associate the sound with the carbon dioxide, we can greatly decrease the use of the carbon dioxide and maybe only use it once or twice a week as a re reinforcement instead of every time the locks open, which on an average is eight to 12 times a day. And we don't wanna be putting carbon dioxide in the water eight to 12 times a day. And so at MESARC, we're gonna do these uh, shuttle box experiments. And if you can just see on the right of the screen, the fish is placed in, in one side of, the, of a circular tank, and then we will add CO2 and sound, and, and the fish will move out into the other side of the tank. And so we want to see how soon we can condition fish, what the optimal CO2 concentration is, and the frequency of carbon dioxide reinforcement. How often after we've conditioned the fish do we have to go back and add the CO2 again, just to remind the fish that, oh yes, sound equals CO2. If it works, uh, if either one works uh, in, in the lab, our, our next step in the future is to go and do field trials at locks and dams. So thank you for your attention and I look forward to your questions. Hi, right, thank you. So I'm going to describe a, a project with Dan, Dan Larkin um, aimed at integrating professional and citizen science monitoring to improve aquatic invasive species surveillance. And just to kind of hit you right with the project summary, um, our goal is to develop a modeling framework for integrating professional and citizen science data with the goals of leading to smarter surveillance and improve estimates of aquatic invasive species distribution that can account for things like imperfect detection and sampling biases. So we collect lots of uh, data on aquatic invasive species and these data differ in terms of their quantity and quality and, and various features. Um, we collect high level point intercept survey data depicted here on the, the panel on the left where we have known locations um, throughout a lake, high survey effort, um, we've got um, data now on sentinel surveys, which are more likely to um, be meandering paths that, that try and target areas that are most likely to, to um, contain new invaders. So maybe along docks or shorelines. We have formal uh, citizen science programs that are collecting data from volunteers. And then we've got databases that have a collection of opportunistic records um, for example, the Minnesota DNR's list of infested waters that we can also use to inform surveillance and estimates of aquatic invasive species distribution. So as I mentioned, there's trade-offs uh, involved in these different sorts of data sources. So if you consider, for example, citizen science monitoring, we can sample potentially quite a few lakes, but our sampling effort within lakes tends to be pretty limited and likely to be biased towards areas that are easy to access. So for example, maybe near dock, uh, dock locations that may not represent um, the, be a representative sample from the full lake. On the other extreme with AIS professional monitoring, we can sample very intensely, but for a smaller number of lakes. So with this type of sampling, we have known sampling effort and we have a lot of benefits. In, for example, we can use spatial replicates to inform things like estimates of detection probability. Given that an invader is in a lake at a certain density, what's the probability we'll actually detect that invader given a certain level of sampling? We also can avoid various within lake sampling biases because we can sample the entire lake. So our goal is to integrate these different sources and develop a modeling framework that can leverage the strengths um, from these different types of data. And I don't want to go into this figure in a whole lot of detail, but the things that I want to point out is the, the important features of this approach. So we're going to have a biological process model that um, reflects all of the different features that impact whether a lake has presence or absence of an invasive species. And then we have to have different observation models that reflect the way that we collect the data um, 
from the, the different sources in, that, that represent the different ways we collect data for these different sources. So we need to be able to combine those different um, observation models with the same sort of underlying biological model to, in order to leverage the strengths of different data sources. We're gonna apply this modeling framework to two high priority aquatic invasive plant species, Eurasian water milfoil and starry stonewort. And these sort of represent different extremes. We have quite a bit of data on Eurasian water milfoil. Um, the amount of data that we have for starry stonewort is much more limited. So this is going to allow us to um, develop this framework and think about how we might apply it across a range of different aquatic invasive species. And then lastly, we're gonna use simulations to explore more generally how we, how we can improve the way we um, monitor lakes so that we can consider different ways to allocate sampling effort um, and how to leverage these strengths across different types of structured and unstructured data sources. I'm the last one, I think, so um, I'm going to stop sh sharing my screen and we can move to the question and answer period. Great, thank you, John. Thank you to all of our presenters. Um, those are great kind of summaries of the research that you'll be doing um, with MACERC over the next couple of years. Um, we do have a couple questions that I can turn to first, but a reminder to those of you that are attending that if you do have a question for any of our presenters, we have about um, like 15 minutes here that we can spend answering questions. So feel free to drop those questions into the Q&A box or the chat box and I will pull those forward for our presenters. Um, our first question is for Amy, and the question is from Jeff, is that, is the lower DO and cattail infested areas due to the decomposition of cattail litter, or is it for another reason? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, what we suspect is happening is, um, what happens in a, in a near show zone, which you probably know, is DO goes, gets really low at night when there's a lot of respiration, but not a lot of photosynthesis occurring. So the DO is pretty low at night, both in cattail and non-cattail areas. Um, but during the day, that DO then swings back up. Um, but because cattail is so dense, water, you know, waves are not bringing water from deeper into the lake into those interior cattail zones. So we suspect what's really happening is oxygen, oxygen rich, rich water just takes a longer time to get there and isn't arriving at those interior zones with cattail as it is when you have like bull rush where there's lots of spaces among the plants and, and waves can propagate into those interiors more quickly. That's what we suspect is happening, um, but we'll hopefully get a better idea from this project. Great, thank you. Um, and then the next question um, is just for Al, could you just quickly summarize again what the impact of adding the CO2 to the water would be for invasive carp? What you're aiming towards and adding that in with the sound? Yes, so uh, fish hate CO2. They have uh, external and internal sensors that are very good at detecting CO2 and they will avoid CO2 whenever possible. So by adding the CO2 to the water and conditioning them to detect the CO2 with the sound, we hope that the fish will anticipate every time that there's sound played, CO2 is going to follow. And so that will allow us to uh, lessen the amount of times that we uh, actually have to add the CO2 because the fish will be conditioned to associate CO2 with sound. Thank you. And so the ultimate goal for that is to prevent movement upstream, right? For Yes. yes. Okay. Thank you. Those are the two questions we have so far. If any other attendees have questions, please do drop them in. You all did such a great job of summarizing your work. <laughs> there aren't many follow-up questions. I could ask Amy a question. If you, uh, Amy, want to, could you talk a little bit about some of the partners that you'll be working with with your project? Yes, sure. Um, so we are working with Minnesota DNR. So um, Shane uh, McBride is the aquatic plant management coordinator. Um, and Donna Dustin is a fisheries research biologist in Duluth Lakes. They've been really helpful um, 
helping us select sites. We actually already have a list of 30 sites there, especially aquatic plant management and regional fisheries managers know the land, lay of the land well, so they've given us some potential sites to start with. And then in Voyagers National Park, um, Steve Wendells has been working on cattail removal in a similar way. So we'll probably locate a few sites up there and they will help us with cattail removal and also running us to and from sites and with some data collection. So we're really excited about those partnerships. Thank you. Yeah. Um, one more question for Al here too from Megan. Um, would you expect conditioning of the cart from CO2 to need to happen on a regular basis? For example, a reconditioning each year? That's an excellent question. And that's uh, certainly the experiment that, that we need to do uh, once we condition the fish. We've conditioned common carp to associate food with sound and that conditioning's lasted for two to three months at a time. However, they're highly motivated to, to eat. So um, this is a little bit tougher. And uh, I, I would think if, if you had me guess, we probably have to reinforce it once a week, uh, at least in the beginning, because what's happening is, is new fish will be coming into the area. And even though the carp school and they sort of play follow the leader, I think a, a weekly reinforcement would, would be great. And, and especially in Minnesota with the, the shipping season, somewhat limited. Uh, we're not talking about year-round um, um, carbon dioxide application. And so maybe maybe four to five times a month would, would be my guess. But certainly by the end of the next, by the end of 2021, we should know the answer to that uh, based on our indoor experiments. Okay, another follow-up question for you, Al. Um, does the CO2 strip out the oxygen levels in the water body, thus affecting other fish like trout? Yeah, that's another great question, and yes, it does. And so that's one of the reasons we want to minimize the uh, uh, application of CO2. Now, we believe most of the swimming fish, which, you know, we don't have many native fish that can't swim out of the way, that all the native fish will also swim away with the carp. However, when it's only the sound, we think the native fish, most of the native fish can't even hear the sound we're playing, so they won't be affected. So yes, the CO2 will stop native fish whenever it's, it's, play, whenever it's used, but that's why we don't want to use it every time when we play um, the sound. Thank you. All right, one more question for Dan. Are you worried about a super native, super native escaping and causing a problem with Ray? Yeah, good question. Um, you know, you certainly want to be careful about spreading um, even genotypes of even native species around too much. You know, that's an issue in restoration, for example. You don't want to lose locally adapted genotypes. In the case of Phragmites, because it is a grass that is um, pollinated and dispersed by wind, it already has a really large geographic footprint. And we think that, um, you know, even if there were sort of a hardy native genotype that got used more in these wastewater treatment facilities, that, that would still be lower risk. We'd be better off with kind of uh, spurring a more aggressive native genotype than having these um, reed beds with invasive phragmites to reseed the landscape. Thank you. And a question for John. Um, can you reiterate how a manager could potentially implement or use the results of your project? Yeah, so I think um, there's there's two parts to that. One will be the information that we get um, will hopefully be uh, so. If you consider, for example, the two types of data that I contrasted, if you just think about citizen science data, the if you summarize those data, you might get a very biased picture of what's on the landscape. So what we're hoping to do is combine different data sources to overcome different types of sampling bias and um, be able to also provide better estimates of quantities like given that an invader is present, what's the probability you detected it? So if you didn't detect it in your lake, 
what's the sort of probability that um, you may just had a false detection. So the first, first answer I would say is that we hope to provide better metrics by which you can um, manage your lakes. The second piece might be if you're managing a lake and you're trying to decide, well, where should I sample or how should I sample? The last aspect of trying to really get at what are the trade-offs in terms of how we sample and how we integrate data, we'll hopefully approach that and provide some guidance. So for example, you might say, well, we wanna bring out citizen scientists, they can sample along the docks, but we're gonna also need to sample a certain proportion of the lake in a more representative way to be able to integrate with that but more biased um, data that's gonna be maybe targeting areas near docks. So I, my answer would be two parts. Hopefully we can provide better metrics for management and the second would be better guidance potentially on how to, how to do surveillance. That's great, thank you. All right, we have just a couple more minutes if anybody else has questions. Um, Panelists, that goes for you too, if you have questions for each other. <laughs> and just a reminder, either the Q&A um, window or the chat window work. We'll get questions from either of those. I guess I have a question. I'm not a but I'm more of a quantitative ecologist than a biologist. So for Alan, just out of curiosity with, um, with more native fish that might not be affected by the sound, do carp interact in any sort, do they change their behavior based on what other fish do at all? Would there be any danger of, of them seeing, well, other fish are responding in a way that doesn't seem like they're impacted, they're moving forward even though there's sound here? Is there any sort of information there or? or um, that, that's a good question. Um, you have to remember that the, at least the big headed carp are filter feeders. And so they pretty much ignore uh, most native fish. They're, they're not preyed on by uh, natives unless they're really small. So the adults certainly seem to ignore uh, virtually everything. And, and because they're filter feeding, they're, they're, their swimming dynamics is, is a little bit different than most of the native fish that are not uh, necessarily filter feeders. So we, uh, and However, and, and the other thing is in Illinois, where I've, I've studied most of the fish, there's no native fish left. It's, it's all carp, and that's that's certainly something we want to avoid in, in Minnesota. But I, I don't think, I think the carp will cue on carp. I don't think they'll cue on other uh, species. All right. So with no other questions and questions from attendees, I think I'm gonna cut us off there. Um, so thank you again to all of our presenters. Again, we're excited to work with you over the next couple of years. Um, and for all of the attendees, you'll be getting updates on these projects. Um, if you're not already signed up for our uh, emails or following at MACERC on social media, those are good places to link in to get updates on projects like these and some of the other new ones too. And if you're interested in um, New, the others, we have four more presentations before this one from new um, researchers that are coming on board with this request for proposals this year. And that session was recorded and will be shared with all of the others too, if you'd like to view that. So thank you again. Um, and we will reconvene for our panel, our success stories panel at 2.30 today. So we'll hope to see you there. Thanks everybody for attending and thanks Corey and Pat. Yeah, yep. Thanks. Thanks everyone.